Hello and welcome to this edition of Talking Subs. In this episode, we're going to be talking to the former head of the Northern Ireland Civil Service, Sir David Sterling, about what policymakers can do to take action and also some of the environmental initiatives that have been taken in the past. Thank you, David. Good to be here. Um, so, David, just first question I have for you is why, in your view, is it important that we prioritise uh, environmental issues such as single-use plastics? Well, I think everybody would accept now that um, we have an environmental crisis in our hands. You know, Sir David Attenborough has said if we don't take dramatic action in the next 10 years, we could face irreversible damage to the natural world and the collapse of our societies. Um, you know, and in Northern Ireland, you know, we know that many of our rivers and watercourses are in very poor condition. Our sea isn't sufficiently protected and we need to do much more to protect and restore nature on land and sea. And I think the start for all this needs to be, we need to start valuing uh, our nature more and reducing our use of plastic, I think would be an important and vital step. And I think one of the, one of the, uh, one of the attractions about dealing with single use plastic is it's something that everybody can play a part in. Uh, and it's something that we, I think we can use to explain to people how important it is we do more just to protect our environment. And David, in your experience, how has Northern Ireland approached this issue in the past? Obviously, you've got um, a vast experience as you know, former head of civil service. So how do you think we've, we've approached this in the past? Yeah, well, I think it's a bit mixed, David. You know, um, Northern Ireland isn't really the green and pleasant land that many people think it is. Like, I think we look around uh, and we look at the green fields, the trees and the rest, and we think we've got a, a great environment. The reality is we don't. Uh, Northern Ireland rates as one of the worst countries for biodiversity loss. I think we're something like 19th worst out of over 200 countries. Um, we know that we have many issues in and around our climate. Um, and I don't think there's a sufficient awareness of just how bad our rivers, our water courses, our environment, our sea, uh, you know, all is. Um, and in response to that, you know, I think my view would be that the environment isn't really a particularly high priority for our political parties. And that's in part because we have so many other issues to be dealt with here. Um, and because of that, I don't think we've always handled environmental issues particularly well. I don't think we've given them sufficient priority. There have been some good things that we've done in the past. And I think you go back to um, 2013, the plastic bag levy was an example of where Northern Ireland actually did something that was trailblazing. You know, with the first uh, first part of the UK to actually introduce a plastic bag levy, it reduced the use of plastic bags by about ninety five percent. And despite some concerns that this was going to really damage the retail industry and all the rest, it actually worked very well. P people complied with it, uh, and it was a good example. But I think if you look at some of the other bigger issues around climate change, the state of our peatlands, uh, let's just say the state of our marine environment, there's much more to be done. Um, uh, and, and as I say, my concern is that there isn't sufficient priority being attached to environmental issues. Uh, and I think something like single use plastic can be the thing that can be a catalyst for change in that regard. Yeah, and why do you, just out of curiosity, why do you think that this hasn't got the power? Because obviously the environment in many other countries is a defining issue. You know, for example, Australia just recently had a general election. Climate change was the central issue of that election. Canada, the same issue. Why in Northern Ireland do you think that this hasn't got the same traction as it is in those countries? I, I don't have a good answer to that, David, because, you know, even when you look at, you know, attitudes to the environment and climate amongst young people, you know, around the world, we see that um, the drive for change is, is tending to come from young people. There doesn't seem to, you know, we, we have some wonderful young environmentalists here and we have some you know, great young people who get really actively involved in campaigning on environmental issues. But by and large, um, we don't see the same pressure for change from our people here that we see in other areas. Uh, and as I say, 
I'm sure there's lots of reasons for that. And I'm sure one of them is just that there are so many other issues here, you know, issues in and around um, inequality, um, you know, the, the fact that a lot of people are in financially difficult circumstances is probably more of preoccupation for a lot of people here than maybe in other areas. Um, and then our politics as well probably don't lend themselves to campaigning on some of these issues as well, just as, as they do in other areas. But it is something that has to change. Uh, and there has been some encouraging signs, like, for example, I think the, um, the discussions and the debate around the Climate Change Act that we now have uh, showed that there is that interest there. And I think that that is something that we can now capitalise and build upon. Yeah, and obviously that you lead very nicely on to my next question. So obviously we did have the passage of the climate change bill. It took a long time getting there, but we got there eventually. Um, how do we build on this moment and how do we keep the momentum going? Because, you know, there is there is the risk that people think that, oh, well, now the act is passed. Well, that's mission accomplished. So how do, how do we build on that progress? Yeah, it, it's a really good point. Um, you know, passing the act was difficult, but it might well be one of the easiest things along the journey because the fact is action is going to need to be taken. And if you look at a global level, um, you know, there was huge momentum towards uh, tackling climate change up until the Ukraine war. And you now see governments around the world having to reverse some of the policies they were putting in place, for example, around reducing fossil fuels and, all, on, and what have you. Uh, and that's in response to the impact the, uh, the you know the Ukraine war has had. So there's going to need to be a redoubling of effort along the way. Um, like research shows that if you want to um, see successful large scale social change, for that to be effective, you probably need about one in four people to be actively involved. So I think as far as climate and environmental issues in Northern Ireland are concerned, sort of the environmental groups I would work with, the desire is to see one in four people becoming actively involved. And going back to one of my earlier points, I think the fact that single-use plastics are something that people can see, uh, they can see the impact of them on our roadsides, you know, on our verges, you know, in our fields, um, but they can also see how uh, despite a lot of effort over the last few years, actually the use of single-use plastics is probably still increasing. So if we can actually mobilise people to be active in this regard, I think that can be something that can be built on for you know to, to deliver progress more widely on a range of climate and environmental issues. Uh, and you know even you just you think you know we've been living with COVID for over two years now. Um, and it just the, the, the amount of extra single-use plastic that that has generated is quite incredible. You know, when you think in hospitals and care homes, you know, gowns, gloves, um, all the paraphernalia that's needed to protect people. Uh, and then we're all testing ourselves regularly. And, you know, every, you know, I'm having to test myself occasionally. And, you know, there's at least seven small pieces of plastic every time you test. And none of that's being recycled. So this is this is something that we're all seeing every day. I think the next step is to just really mobilize people so that they understand that they can do something about this. Yeah, and that's a that's a great point about COVID and about some of the challenges, the increased challenges that we're now facing um, on this file. Um, uh, my next question to you, David, is then: so we want policymakers to take issues on key issues such as single-use plastics. Um, obviously, you were saying. It, the hard work starts here in many respects. Um, why is it essential, in your view, for local and devolved governments to continue to support and press for further action? Well, um, I think really, if you don't have a sort of, if you don't, if you can't manage to see a momentum for change, if you can't see pressure building from a variety of sources, you know, my experience shows that ministers have so many preoccupations. There are so many uh, issues that come before them that without sustained pressure, um, it may well be that things are just neglected. It's not that you know ministers don't necessarily consider them important. It's just they've got so many things they have to deal with. You know, th there's the old saying, you know, the crying baby gets lifted. Um, and 
you know, there's no doubt uh, when you look at the things that get done around here, um, they're often in response to a concerted, relentless campaign where people from a variety of backgrounds are coming together in a coalition to actually press for change. So, you know, if we're looking at single use plastic, you know, people will need to be relentlessly active using media, using all forms of lobbying um, and making sure that ministers and political parties are regularly faced with um, just you know, a, a demand from the people that something must be done. Yeah, and um, how then can we support representatives to take action? Because quite often, you know, you, you'll get public representatives who say, OK, great, we, 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 we recognise that, for example, we see single-use plastics um, uh, on our roadside, we see um, uh, this is an issue, but, you know, what realistically can we do? So, so how do we support our representatives in taking, in taking a concrete action? Well, I think at the individual level, um, there's a lot that you can do just in terms of your personal behaviour. But if you want to have a bigger impact, I think you, know, you can't be actually joining an environmental group. And there are a whole lot of people working in this area. Um, and, you know, if you're in an environmental group, um, you know, I, my advice would be you've got to lobby at all levels. That's at the constituency level with your local councillors, your local MLAs. Um, assembly party groups, the specialist groups that come together to consider specific issues, assembly committees, and indeed ministers. Um, and when it comes to actually how you lobby, you know, I, I, I would always say use whatever means are available. But again, my advice would be sort of focus on a small number of stretching but deliverable asks. There's no point asking ministers to spend half their budget on something whenever their budget is already oversubscribed. Um, you've got to do your research. You've got to know what room to maneuver a minister has. Um, and my advice again would always be try and work with in a, in a coalition with others. Um, there's nothing is more impressive to a minister than if they see a group of several organizations coming together on a single issue rather than a, a lot of individual groups coming together on sort of slightly unrelated issues. Uh, and again, my advice would always be, um, when you're engaging with politicians, you know, be constructive and supportive. Um, sometime, <clears throat> sometimes it can be just as effective to engage behind the scenes rather than public. Yes, by all means, use media and use social media, but don't wag the finger too much because, um, you don't want to get uh, politicians' backs up. You want to get them on side. So that means being constructive and supportive and engaging with them so that you understand you know, and explain how you want to help them to help everybody. You know, that, that, it's a bit of a ramble, but that's in a nutshell, I think, what, how, how you need to go about it. And, uh, and this is my, my last question. It so just ties into what you've just said there. Do you think, you know, the public are on board with them with this type of action. I mean, the public do seem to be looking for ways in which they can, you know, do things differently. Whether it is, you know, for example, with reusable uh, cups, whether it is, for example, you just mentioned uh, a bit earlier in your answer, um, David, there the bag levy as well, and how quickly people, you know, took to it, um, and the bag levy went up there fairly recently. So, 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 in your opinion. What, what, what's the level of public engagement and how far do you think the public are on board with this? David, a, a really good question. I'm glad you asked me that because it reminds me that for a long time, like a very long time, I have sort of felt that the public is sometimes ahead of the politicians. I think sometimes the public's attitude and appetite for change is actually much greater than the parties imagine. I will go back to 2003, you know, the smoking ban in Ireland, um, which everybody thought this is the last place in the world that you would introduce a smoking ban. There'll be no compliance at all. And the reality is it was actually complied with almost fully from the start. Um, and and you know, we saw it here, I think it was 2006, the smoking ban came in here and again, the public understood the reason for it. They got behind it. 
the same with the plastic bag levy. Um, and, and I think of a range of other issues. Um, the, you know, if, if people have it explained to them carefully why something needs to be done, then I think people are public spirited uh, and I think they do want to work together to make this place better. So uh, you know, I, I would certainly say um, that we shouldn't underestimate the capacity of the public, you know, of, of our citizens to work together to make this place better. Okay. David Starling, thank you so much for taking uh, the time to come and uh, chat to us here on Talking Subs. So you've been listening to David Starling, former head of the Northern Ireland Civil Service. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Talking Subs. Please remember to hit the subscribe button so that you can keep up to date with all future episodes from this series. Thank you for watching.